Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to take a look at the life and career of Larry Hagman. You're going to enjoy some of these pictures and clips. Stay tuned, he was on some shows that I'm sure you loved. He was born Larry Martin Hagman, September 21st, 1931 in Fort Worth, Texas. His parents divorced when he was five years old, and his father, Benjamin Jackson Hagman, was an accountant and a lawyer who became a district attorney in Texas. Now, being only five years old, he had to move with his mother, Mary Martin, to California because she was going to pursue a career in acting. When he was seven years old, his mother signed a contract with Paramount Pictures. This meant that she was going to be too busy to take care of him full time. So she sent him to live with her mother, Juanita Presley Martin, back in Texas. Now, his grandmother was getting too ill to take care of him. So they flew him to California and enrolled him in Black Fox Military Institute, which was located in Hollywood, and that's where he stayed. After being there for a couple of years, his mother sent him to Woodstock Country School, which was a boarding school in Vermont. So that's where he continued his education and continued to live. When Larry was a junior in high school, his father in Texas had finally gained enough rights that he could have a say in where Larry lived and went to school. And he asked Larry where he would like to be. And Larry said, in Texas by you. So he moved him there and he went to Weatherford High School for his final two years. Now Larry's father had hoped that he would continue to go to college down there in Texas and pursue a degree in law because then he could join the family's law firm. But Larry had been bitten by the acting bug. So Larry headed to New York, enrolled in Baird College, and majored in dance and drama. After a couple years in college, he moved to England to join the cast of his mother's big stage hit, South Pacific. While he was over there, he joined the U.S. Air Force and served for four years. During the same time period, he met and married Mai Axelson, and he swears that she is the best thing that ever happened to him. They were married in December of 1954 and stayed together forever. After completing his military service, the couple moved to New York City, where he continued to perform on and off of Broadway while holding down a job. This went on for eight years, and during this time period, they had a daughter named Heidi and a son named Preston. They knew they needed to make a change, so they packed up and moved to Hollywood. Just like with all new actors arriving in Hollywood, it was hard to find work. So he did what a responsible father and husband would do, and he held down a job while taking small roles. They were mostly uncredited. But persistence pays off. He appeared three times on the TV show Sea Hunt, playing the character Johnny Greco. Then he got the reoccurring role of Ed Gibson on the daytime drama The Edge of Night. I can use this maybe later on. So what else are you all about? Huh? What's this about? Suppose you tell me, huh? What do you think you're pulling off here? Coming here at 3 o'clock in the morning to see my friend Morrissey, huh? I was investigating an accident. I have to make a report on it. Who are you anyway? What difference does that make? After that, he was on the Defenders TV show for a couple episodes. Then he got to be in the movie Ensign Pulver. And Jack Nicholson was in there with him, too. You wait, Carney? I must be. I can smell that stinking island. Hey, Pulver's taking the mail launch today to pick up our three bottles of scotch. Did he make the deal? Sure, with the Admiral's dining steward. And, and cheap, only 75 bucks a bottle. <laughs> yeah. uh, some cruddy island a thousand miles from here needs another box of toothpicks. Now, Larry says that by this time, he was drinking more and more to suppress the anxiety that he always felt. He was a very nervous person, and he was coping by taking drinks. Now, Jack Nicholson seen this and said, hey, man, you're doing it all wrong. You need to try this. And he offered him marijuana for the first time. Larry said from that day forward, when people would say you're an alcoholic, he would get upset. If they said, hey, you're a pothead, he didn't care because he loved it. The next movie he was in was called Failsafe, and it starred Henry Fonda and Walter Matthau. Now, he became really good friends with the entire Fonda family, so Peter Fonda became a buddy of his. Now, the very next year, 1965, NBC was looking to create a show to go head-to-head -head up against ABC's Bewitched that just came out and went to number two in the ratings. 
That's when the producer Sidney Sheldon pitched the idea of I Dream of Genie, and NBC said, we're signing you for 13 episodes, go find your cast and get started. When Larry heard about this, he went down and auditioned for the part, and he got called back. And then he got called back again. And the third time, it came down between just him and Robert Conrad. And of course, Larry beat him out and got the part of Major Anthony Nelson. Larry said he was really excited. Barbara Eden was his co-star. Bill Daly was on the show. And they were guaranteed to get paid for 13 episodes. And if it became a hit, even more. So he didn't want anything to go wrong. The only problem was everybody was in a hurry to get this show going, so they felt rushed and that made Larry more nervous, which meant he started drinking a little bit more because he didn't want to smoke pot on the set around them. He says this really wasn't a problem at first. Heck, they even brought in champagne for everybody to have before they started their filming for the day. It was all catered, there was alcohol for afterward, and if you were sipping on it during the filming, as long as it didn't affect anything, it was okay because you could see producers and cameramen and everybody was having drinks. Come on, Jeannie, we gotta get back to the jet plane. More. Come on, that's enough. <sighs> Moonshine! Great, just what we need, a stone genie. Now, after they filmed the second episode, they found out that Barbara Eden was pregnant. This threw the whole production into chaos. The producers were freaking out. What are we going to do with a pregnant genie? We don't have plans for this. And so, of course, Larry knows about this. He starts to get more anxiety, which meant more drinking, more pot smoking. And then the producers come up with the game plan. We are going to film the next 10 episodes rapid fire before she starts the show. Here we go. Larry said this is when all the problems really started happening. They were in such a rush to get each script written that they didn't always make sense or flow very good. Sometimes the jokes just weren't funny. Now, he said, looking back, when you watch the first season, you can tell where we were rushing things. And sometimes I would bring this up and they'd say, hey, we're in such a hurry. Don't worry about it. Just go with the flow. And he did. Then other times he said, I had too much to drink. So I would say, no, this joke stinks, you know. And then they'd go, oh, not this again. He'd, they'd go, just shut up and do it. And he'd say, no, you shut up. And he'd start yelling at the producers and the writers. And he thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get fired. But they never did fire him. They couldn't. They were on such a tight schedule. They just kept going. Heck, when they put it out, they didn't even have a theme song. Now, when the show was renewed for a second season and things were going along a lot more smoothly because they were not rushed, you would think that Larry would feel a little bit better. But by this time, his drinking was way out of control. So although he wasn't under as much pressure... He was having outbursts, but this time directing it at the whole cast. So the director made him an ultimatum. Go see a psychiatrist and get this under control, or you're out of here. Larry agreed and entered into therapy. Now after a few weeks, the psychiatrist recommended that he try LSD to help alleviate the alcohol cravings along with his anxiety problems. Larry went ahead and tried LSD. He felt like it helped him, and he enjoyed the feelings while on it. So he told his friend Peter Fonda about it, and he said he needed some more. Peter Fonda said, well, you should talk to David Crosby, the singer from like The Birds, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. And David Crosby became his supplier for like very high quality LSD. And then that became a new addiction for Larry, and he just was taking psychedelics on top of alcohol and marijuana. Now, for the next few years, things just kept escalating out of control. I Dream a Genie was a hit. He had plenty of money. He had friends in Hollywood. He was throwing these huge parties that are still legendary and talked about to this day. Some of the things that happened are actually kind of shocking. One time, Dennis Hopper was there, and Larry threw him out of the house because he said, you screwed Peter Fonda out of royalties on Easy Rider. <laughs> and then um, Dennis Hopper came back in uninvited, and climbed through like the window of his daughter's room and stuff. Everybody was drunk and high. The party was like a who's who of the Hollywood and musicians of the time that partied hardcore. 
Now when I Dream of Genie ended, Larry lucked out and got another shot really quick. The very next year, it was a new series called The Good Life, and it starred him and Donna Mills. Unfortunately, it only lasted for 15 episodes. Then a couple years later, he got another show. It's called Here We Go Again, starring Larry, Diane Baker, and Nita Talbot. I made a video on Nita Talbot, the white Russian from Hogan's Heroes, so I actually researched this show and watched a couple episodes, and I liked it. But unfortunately, it only lasted 13 episodes. What happened next is very common in the industry. If you don't jump right back on another hit show and you put out a couple like flops, then you're considered dead to the industry. And they just move on. You're typecast, outcast. They will still use you for parts in a movie, but no one's going to build anything around you. So for years, they would just throw him in a small role on a movie. He could get a little check and move on. He was done. Here's a perfect example. He was in Superman, but if you look in the credits, he's not in there anywhere. Just one little part, and it's over. Suggest a uh, vigorous chest massage. If that doesn't work, uh, 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 mouth to mouth. Yes, sir. Sergeant, I won't have one of my men doing anything I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. Yeah, but sir, get an ambulance. <laughs> Now in 1978, right after his part in Superman, he auditioned for two different roles and got them both. He was going to be the lead in a show called The Waverly Wonders, which he didn't accept. And good thing, because they only filmed nine episodes. Six of them never aired. It canceled after three. They had Joe Namath go instead, because he chose the other option, to play J.R. Ewing on Dallas. And he chose that because his wife, Mai, said, that character sounds more like you. Now, you could take that as a compliment or an insult, because J.R., oh, he was mean. Now, I don't need to tell you everything about the show, but let's just say Dallas became a hit. It was for adults. This was not a sitcom. His character was a serious dude, and yeah, he was shrewd businessman, and he wasn't taking no for an answer. I mean, he played the part great. So great that he became the most popular actor in America at one point. It was right around 1980. I remember my mom would watch the show, and whenever that Who Shot JR episode came out, oh man, the whole like town that we lived in, they were talking about it. I guess there was not too much going on back then, but it was that way all around the country, probably around the globe too. His portrayal of J.R. Ewing was just spot on amazing. It really hit with the people. They love to hate the bad guy. And this show eclipsed anything and everything he did in his entire career. He played in all 356 episodes. He was even in about six or seven episodes of Knott's Landing, which was a spinoff. This went from 1978 to 1991. He started out, and it, before you knew it, he was the star of the show. He was making $50,000 an episode. Then it went up to $100,000 an episode. Then it went to $200,000 an episode. He was the man. He was so popular, you couldn't even watch a different show without seeing him in the commercials. <laughs> he was in the Schlitz beer commercials. He was doing the BVD underwear commercials. He also had a say in how things were going on the show Dallas. And he brought Barbara Eden in, his old co-star from I Dream of Genie, and she got to play Leanne De La Vega. I'd like to tell you a little story, if I may. It's about an innocent young girl who went away to school and fell in love with a handsome prince. They had what she thought was a beautiful romance. But when she got pregnant, the prince turned into a frog, and he threw her out of his life like five-day-old trash. The moral of the story is that Leanne Nelson should never have kissed a toad like J.R. Ewing. The career resurgence that Larry pulled off is one of the greatest in all of Hollywood's history. Now, in 1991, when the show ended, Larry went on to appear in a couple other things, but then three years later, he was diagnosed with liver cancer. Fortunately, he was able to have a liver transplant and successfully recovered. He went on to appear in more television shows over the years, and in 2012, Dallas came back on the air and he reprised his role of J.R. Ewing, and he appeared in 17 episodes. Now, sadly, on November 23, 2012, Larry passed away at the age of 81 from throat cancer. 
Wow, what an amazing career and comeback that was. Now, I just made a video on Barbara Eden. I think it'd be a great companion to this one. So go ahead and click it on next. Hit me with a like. Give me a subscription. I'm trying real hard here. Cool classics. I love this stuff.